This is Mission Control Houston uh, continuing uh, to watch uh, the progress of Orion as it climbs uh, toward peak altitude, uh, now approaching 3,500 miles in altitude, statute miles, that is, uh, courtesy of the upper stage of the Delta IV rocket, uh, which uh, has performed uh, to uh, perfection in guiding uh, Orion. This is Mission Control Houston here in the uh, Flight Control Room. The Flight Dynamics Officer, Mark McDonald, has just uh, reported back to Flight Director M Mike Serafin uh, that uh, all of uh, the data having been received uh, from the guidance and GPS systems uh, on board uh, Orion have now been processed uh, through the guidance console uh, and his console. Uh, we are predicting uh, a maximum G load on uh, the Orion spacecraft of 8.2 Gs. Uh, that uh, is well within the family expected uh, for this maiden flight. Uh, the predicted uh, splashdown point is uh, just 1.3 nautical miles east of the predicted pre-flight target, which is almost a bullseye splashdown. And the predicted splashdown point is currently estimated at uh, 23.61 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude. That uh, will constitute uh, what we had expected, about 600 uh, miles or so uh, to the west of Baja, California, uh, where the USS Anchorage and the U.S. Uh, naval ship uh, Salvor uh, are uh, in the zone. Uh, they are prepared uh, to uh, work uh, in concert uh, with uh, teams of helicopters, uh, the Yukana uh, unpiloted airborne vehicle uh, to uh, provide all of the uh, landing support. Uh, this is a live view from the Yukana uh, that is uh, arriving at the uh, splashdown zone west of Baja, California. So again, uh, the information uh, being uh, provided uh, by uh, the flight dynamics officer indicates uh, an almost bullseye splashdown predicted for Orion, uh, just uh, 1.3 nautical miles east of its predicted pre-flight target, and again, uh, the coordinates uh, expected for splashdown, 23.61 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude, some 600 uh, statute miles west of Baja, California. We are now uh, just a few miles away from reaching peak altitude. Again, uh, this uh, dramatic view of the limb of the Earth uh, from uh, one of the flight test cameras in the crew module uh, of Orion. Orion currently flying uh, from uh, southwest to northeast in, uh, in an orbit uh, inclined 28.45 degrees to either side of the equator, approaching uh, a point uh, just off the northwestern coast of Australia. Again, all of Orion's systems are operating to perfection so far as we are now uh, just 26 minutes away from separating uh, the crew module from the service module and beginning all of the critical events that will lead up uh, to Orion's high-speed entry back into the Earth's atmosphere and its splashdown in the Pacific Ocean.
This is Mission Control Houston. Orion is now uh, approaching its peak altitude. Currently uh, having passed 3,600 statute miles in altitude. The spacecraft uh, is flying uh, west of the continent of Australia, moving from southwest to northeast. The guidance officer reports uh, that Orion's uh, GPS system is uh, functioning so well, it is uh, exceeding pre-flight predictions in uh, processing uh, data at uh, the altitude that it is currently flying at. We are three hours, five minutes into the maiden flight of Orion with one hour, 19 minutes to go before predicted splashdown in the Pacific. This is Mission Control Houston. The Flight Dynamics Officer Mark McDonald reports that Orion uh, reached its peak altitude at uh, 9.11 a.m. Central Time just about one minute ago at a mission elapsed time of three hours and six minutes into the flight. Peak altitude uh, was calculated uh, by Orion's navigation systems to be 3,604.2 statute miles. That's uh, the equivalent of 3,132 nautical miles. So Orion is now uh, heading downhill, if you will, uh, on the, the trek back to Earth and a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean one hour, 17 minutes from now. Again, peak altitude reached at 9, 11 a.m. Central Time. Uh, that peak altitude calculated by the Flight Dynamics Officer uh, to be 3,604.2 statute miles or 3,132 nautical miles. As uh, we reported uh, a few minutes ago, uh, earlier, uh, just about uh, five minutes or so ago, about ten minutes ago, uh, the flight dynamics officer reported uh, that the onboard uh, systems uh, aboard Orion has uh, processed a predicted uh, G-force uh, to be built up on the spacecraft. Uh, if you were a crew member sitting inside the crew module, you would be experiencing a pull of 8.2 Gs that's uh, just to put that in perspective, a uh, crew that returns uh, from Earth in a Soyuz spacecraft from the International Space Station pulls about four and a half Gs uh, as it uh, enters into the Earth's atmosphere. So Orion will be pulling about uh, 8.2 Gs during uh, the course of its high-speed reentry back to Earth. Its uh, predicted splashdown target is uh, just 1.3 nautical miles or 1.5 statute miles east of its 
pre-flight predicted target. That's almost a bullseye splashdown expected uh, for Orion. And the uh, coordinates of the predicted splashdown site, 23.61 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude, some 600 uh, statute miles west of Baja, California. The Spaceflight Meteorology Group here at the Johnson Space Center uh, has uh, maintained its uh, forecast throughout the morning of winds uh, out of uh, zero, three, uh, 0 degrees at about 12 knots at the splashdown site and wave heights of about 4.5 feet. Uh, those wave heights have picked up ever so slightly since uh, the beginning of the mission uh, just over three hours ago, but uh, certainly well within uh, uh, constraints uh, for a safe and efficient recovery of Orion once it's on the water. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, the next critical milestone for Orion is uh, coming up in just 10 minutes, the separation of the crew module from the uh service module. We're expecting uh, the uh, upper stage of the Delta IV uh, to uh, maneuver uh, the vehicle into the correct uh, separation orientation. Once Orion separates, 
It will uh, maneuver 180 degrees uh, through the use of its thrusters uh, to place its heat shield forward uh, for the start of its uh, high-speed return back into the Earth's atmosphere. Entry interface is just under an hour from now, and that's where uh, the rubber meets the road, if you will, uh, with the testing of Orion's uh, heat shield uh, to repel temperatures uh, that will build uh, upon Orion up to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, that all in preparation for the rapid-fire succession of a series of 11 parachutes that will pull the uh, forward bay cover uh, at the top of the spacecraft off and then uh, enable the drogue chutes and then the main parachutes to deploy in sequential fashion. And uh, just uh, in terms of geography, uh, just a minor uh, correction uh, to what I had been indicating earlier, uh, the splashdown target uh, for Orion uh, would put it about 275 miles west of Baja, about 630 miles southwest of San Diego. Uh, that's uh, the port uh, at the naval base there to which uh, Orion will be returned to uh, as it is uh, towed back into port over the next uh, few days by the USS Anchorage once it's secured in the well deck of the Anchorage. So the splashdown uh, uh, target uh, for Orion, depending on how you look at it uh, geographically, is uh, going to be about 275 miles west of Baja, about 630 miles southwest of San Diego. To recap uh, all of the events of the day, uh, it has been uh, an historic day as uh, America takes uh, its next step in space exploration uh, with the launch of Orion atop the Delta IV heavy rocket occurring on time at uh, 6.05 a.m. Central Time, 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time from Launch Complex 37 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Uh, some six minutes and change after launch, the first two critical Orion program milestones were achieved with the jettisoning of the uh, three large uh, fairing panels uh, surrounding the uh, service module mass simulator article uh, atop which uh, the Orion spacecraft is mounted. That was followed uh, just moments later by the jettisoning of the launch abort system uh, that uh, completed, uh, again, the first two uh, major programmatic milestones. The uh, upper stage of the uh, Delta IV rocket uh, fired twice, uh, first uh, for 11 and a half minutes to place Orion in its first uh, elliptical orbit of the Earth, followed uh, by a second firing uh, at the uh, 1 hour 55 minute mark into the flight. Uh, that was a 4 minute uh, 35 second burn that broke Orion out of low Earth orbit and uh, sent it uh, through the Van Allen radiation belt for the first of two such transits uh, through the radiation belt. The second one is coming up. Uh, Orion reached its peak altitude uh, at 9.11 a.m. Central Time of 3,604.2 statute miles above the Earth, the farthest uh, any uh, human-occupied or human-rated spacecraft has been in 42 years since the flight of Apollo 17, the final uh, human mission to the moon. We are now standing by for the uh, separation of the crew module from the service module less than five and a half minutes from now.
atop uh, the upper stage of the Delta IV rocket. Orion is in the uh, proper orientation for its uh, pyrotechnic separation from the uh, service module mass simulator. Standing by for that uh, major milestone three minutes and 45 seconds from now. The uh, upper stage of the Delta IV has been placed in uh, what is called free drift. Its uh, thrusters uh, commanded to uh, being disabled temporarily uh, to uh, prevent any uh, inadvertent perturbations uh, on Orion at the time of uh, crew module separation. Once uh, the uh, Orion is free, flying on its own for the first time, uh, the Delta IV's uh, attitude control system will be uh, re-enabled. The second stage goes back into its own attitude control in order uh, to provide uh, the correct orientation for its uh, uh, firing for a third time of its engine uh, to dispose it into the uh, Pacific Ocean well away from Orion's splashdown point. Coming up on the two-minute mark until Orion flies free for the first time. After reaching a uh, peak altitude of 3,604.2 statute miles above the Earth, Orion is now 3,315 miles in altitude, statute miles. One minute, 20 seconds until Orion separates uh, from the upper stage of the Delta IV. Inside 30 seconds now until crew module separation. Crew module separation is now confirmed at 9.28 a.m. Central Time. Orion flies free for the first time in its history at a mission elapsed time of 3 hours 24 minutes into its maiden flight. Orion uh, currently processing uh, excellent guidance commands through its onboard uh, system, its thrusters providing perfect control. We have a very stable spacecraft now at an altitude of 3,200 uh, statute miles above the Earth. Time to splash down 59 minutes.
As we take uh, this uh, major milestone and the next step in uh, human space exploration uh, for the United States of America on board the International Space Station, the Expedition 42 crew uh, has been watching activities throughout the course of the morning with great interest, uh, led by uh, Commander Butch Wilmore. Here is a still picture of uh, the crew from left to right, Alexander Samakutiaev, Anton Shkaplerov, Samantha Christopheretti of uh, the European Space Agency, and Butch Wilmore uh, watching the launch of the Delta IV rocket uh, that took place at 6.05 a.m. Central Time, 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time. The crew has been uh, following all of the activities at yesterday's scrub and all of the activities throughout the course of the day today in uh, this maiden flight of Orion uh, with great interest uh, as they uh, are using the International Space Station, of course, as a uh, test bed, as a platform for technology uh, development and demonstration for uh, all of the uh, hardware that will be vital for a trip uh, to Mars in the not-too-distant future. So to recap, uh, Orion is flying free for the first time in its history, uh, having separated uh, just a few moments ago from the uh, upper stage of the Delta IV rocket and the uh, service module that served it so well throughout the course of the day today. Uh, launch occurring three hours, 26 minutes ago, and we are now just 57 minutes away from splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we are expecting an on-target, almost a bullseye splashdown for Orion. We'll be back with all of that a short time from now, but at this moment, let's go back uh, to where it all began this morning at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida and Brandy Dean at Hangar AE. Brandy? Thanks, Rob. Back here now in the Mission Director Center at Hangar AE in Cape, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And uh, the mission management team's continuing to watch. A few minutes ago, there was applause in the room when the uh, service module separated from the crew module and left the crew module to fly alone and make its return home. Coming up now on that, as a uh, as uh, Rob said, splashed down in less than half, in less than an hour now, uh, and that uh, means that we're coming up on what's really the the trial by fire that we've been looking forward to, the test of the heat shield, so that we can make sure it can handle the heat when we are coming back from deep space destinations. The farther you go, the faster you come back, and so the more heat that's generated on the on the heat shield, and so we want to make sure that it is uh, going to be up to the task of, of returning astronauts safely to Earth when they are on are on board. Uh, the heat shield on Orion is uh, 16 and a half feet wide, the largest of its kind ever built, and uh, it was built around a titanium skeleton with a carbon fiber skin that gives the heat shield its shape and also supports the uh, loads at landing. It will still uh, be going about 20 miles per hour when it finally splashes down under its parachutes today. The uh, skin and, uh, and, uh, and skeleton are covered in a fiberglass uh, honeycomb structure that fits over the skin. Uh, that honeycomb has about 320,000 cells, each of which was individually filled with uh, material called avcoat. Avcoat's an ablative material, and that means that instead of transferring the heat, it's going to be uh, burning away. That means that the heat won't be transferred back uh, into Orion itself as that material burns away, and that'll keep uh, things for inside from getting too hot. But at, at its thickest point, the heat shield's only about 1.6 inches thick and 20% of that will burn away as Orion passes through the extreme heat of entry interface that's coming up. During that time, the heat shield will reach temperatures near 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about uh, twice as hot as molten lava, so nothing to laugh about, uh, but that is only 80% of what the heat shield will have to withstand when it's coming back from the vicinity of the moon. Again, the farther you go, the faster you come back and the hotter it gets during reentry. But 80% is enough to give us a good check out. Uh, that uh, rocket, uh, Delta IV heavy rocket that took us into space today, is the uh, largest one currently available. And that's uh, it's high enough to get us to the distance we went. Uh, but, but to go any further, we'll need the space launch system, which should be coming up soon. It'll be the most powerful rocket ever built and be able to get us into those deep, des deep space destinations that give us the really fast reentry and high temperatures. We spoke to Orion Aerothermodynamics engineer Molly White at Johnson Space Center recently to get some more information on the heat shield. And we're going to take a look at that next year on NASA television. Hi, my name is Molly White, and I'm a heat shield engineer for Orion. 
The Orion spacecraft is designed to go further than humans ever have before. And the further out you go, the faster you come back. And the faster you come back, the hotter you get. So Orion needs a really, really good heat shield to protect its crew from that really, really hot air that's going to be around it when it comes back. Why Orion needs a heat shield? If we think about friction, and I'm moving my hands past each other, just moving them pretty slowly, I can still feel heat build up between my hands. It gets hotter. Well, if we think about Orion, which is going 25 to 30 times the speed of sound, it has that same friction with the air, only it's going way faster than my hands can. So there's a lot of heat that is around Orion that it needs to be protected from. The heat shield for Orion, it's 16 and a half feet in diameter. It's the largest, most innovative heat shield of its kind. The heat shield weighs about a thousand pounds. The total vehicle mass is about 20,000 pounds. So it's about 1 20th the weight of Orion just for the heat shield itself. So Orion for its first flight test will see surface temperatures at around 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've developed new materials for Orion that can withstand those higher temperatures. The material for Orion is actually designed to withstand up to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. My favorite part of working on Orion is just the fantastic group of really, really smart people that I get to work with every day. They are excited and passionate as I am about taking humans further than we ever have before, bringing back all the technology and everything that we've developed out there back here to Earth just to improve our lives. And that's the thing that I get most excited about when coming to work. Although the heat shield will see the highest temperatures during re-entry, the rest of the vehicle doesn't get a break. Uh, the sides of Orion, which you can uh, see here represented in this graphic, are covered with 970 tiles that make up Orion's back shell. These tiles are almost identical to those that protected the belly of the space shuttles as they were re-entering uh, from their trips around the Earth. But the temperatures on the side of Orion will get up to 3,150 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, to better understand how Orion would fare if one of those tiles was damaged by micrometeoroid, micrometeoroid orbital debris in space, uh, two small holes have been drilled into two of the tiles on Orion's back shell. Each one is a uh, one inch and uh, one inch wide and one inch deep. Well, one is one inch deep, and the second is 1.4 inches deep. Uh, and the data that the engineers collect from having those two holes in the tiles will allow them to verify that the models that show how Orion will fare as it's coming home from deep space uh, are valid. Even after Orion's heat shield does its job and the spacecraft comes out unscathed on the other side of the extreme re-entry temperatures, there's still a lot of tests left to do uh, before Orion wraps up its day. And it's all going to be packed into just a few minutes. The last five minutes before splashdown are all parachutes. Orion has 11 in all that uh, it uses to slow down from about 300 miles per hour after it comes out the other side of the Earth's atmosphere and uh, goes down to less than 20 miles per hour for a safe landing. Parachute systems basically assemble themselves in flight as Orion is falling toward the ocean, and it has to work in order to keep astronauts safe when they return home. We spoke with Tara Radke, who is the Orion Integrated Landing Systems Manager, about the parachutes recently at Johnson Space Center. We're going to take a look at that now. My name is Tara Radke, and I'm the System Manager for Orion Integrated Landing Systems. So, even though Orion has performed the majority of its mission of taking humans to space and then returning back home, we still have to do the last really important part, slowing down so that we can safely land and be recovered from the ship and back home. Orion's coming back from deep space and re-enters the atmosphere, going really fast. The guidance navigation control system does some maneuvering to help slow down the vehicle. And at that point, start looking for the right conditions to deploy the parachutes. The first parachutes that come out are the four big cover parachutes. They're mortar deployed, so they're fired basically with cannons out the back of the vehicle at 125 feet per second. After those are inflated, pyrotechnic piston thrusters push the cover off and jettison it away and that exposes all the other parachutes that are on the top of the vehicle that can, so they can perform their job. The next parachutes in the sequence are the drogue parachutes. The drogue parachutes again are also mortar fired 
out into the clean air so that they can properly deploy. And they actually open in stages, so they slowly open up so that they don't have a hard force on the vehicle or on the parachutes themselves and damage them. At that point, we actually cut the drogue parachutes so that those parachutes are able to leave, and the next parachutes, the pilot parachutes, are able to deploy at that point. The pilot parachutes are small chutes. They're actually 11 feet in diameter and are actually used to pull the main parachutes out of the bay. The main parachutes are the large ones. Those are 300 pounds and when they are fully inflated, 116 feet in diameter. The main parachutes do the majority of the job of slowing down the vehicle. All three main parachutes deploy. They also open in stages to protect the structure and the parachutes and the crew on board. And at that point, slow the vehicle down to about 25 feet per second when it lands in the water. Working in the descent and landing phase is really challenging. You're coming from extreme environments that you've had to go along on the ride the entire way. As we work with the parachutes, as we work with the GNC team and how all these pieces fit together, it feels like a very important job to make sure that we're taking care of the crew, that we're bringing them back safely, and that we land and keep the vehicle safe around them and are able to recover them safely. So just uh, less than an hour now to go until Orion is ready to splash in on the Pacific Ocean, wrapping up today's trial by fire. Orion's made it through many of its, or, or all of its milestones so far successfully, but of course it still has several to go uh, with the parachutes and uh, the re-entry left to uh, come in today's flight. We hope to have video from Orion for much of its return, including possibly a look at the parachutes from above Orion. Uh, through its windows as it's return as it's coming uh, down for its splash down the Pacific Ocean, and as it makes its way to the Pacific o Pacific Ocean for splash down, we're also hoping to get a good view of it under the parachutes from a distance as well. That'll be coming from the Icona unmanned aerial vehicle that uh, we saw some great video from earlier. It'll be uh, arriving at the splash down zone and. Uh, getting in place to look at the area that Orion is scheduled to splash down in. Again, that's called the Icona, and it's an interesting vehicle in its own right, so we're going to take a closer look at it now. On launch day, before the actual launch of the Orion takes place in Florida, the Icona will take off from NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center and head out to the Pacific to acquire the Orion capsule on reentry and look at the parachutes as they come out. So we'll be at an altitude that when the Orion capsule is coming in, um, it'll be coming towards us. Um, as it's going down. We're going to use the infrared camera to acquire the vehicle as it's coming down and eventually change to the optical camera to give better situational awareness of what's going on on the splashdown. Ikana is a Native American Choctaw word that means conscious, self-aware, intelligent. And the reason we chose that name for the airplane is that we were interested in doing research in autonomous control in ways that the airplane could assist the pilot in avoiding collisions or avoiding traffic and being able to respond to its own environment in a safe way. The agency has used the Icana UAS in several different ways. Icana supported the Western States fire mission. The goal there was to provide situational awareness to the firefighters in the middle of fighting a fire and do it in almost real-time manner, something they have not been able to have from the air in the same way. Okay, we're leveling off at 12,000. Our first test point is going to have us around 80 knots. To, uh, We've also flown fiber optic technology on the airplane to measure the wing bending uh, on the airplane. Push over, pull up. Gotcha. With the fiber, they could measure like hundreds of times more of what the wing was doing. So if you want to have the feedback to what you want the wing to do, either by bending the wing or bending other surfaces, you have way more feedback by doing it this way. Oakland Center for Hawk 2-1, it looks like I'll be overtaking traffic. Uh, my nose for uh, about three miles. I'd like to deviate right.
Right now, we're getting ready to fly the airplane with a research flight control system that will allow an eventual autonomous capability of the airplane, primarily for self-separation. Our goal is to improve the safety of UAS flying in the national airspace, and if we can help the pilots on the ground controlling the remotely piloted airplanes um, know where the traffic around them is and give them standard ways to separate from that traffic, this would be a great uh, way to, to do that. Oakland Center, I got a traffic advisory saying that I have uh, zero 02 Sierra overtaking. I'd like to deviate right for traffic. Hawk 2 1 approved as requested. One minute to recovery. That it was a closer look at the Icona unmanned aerial vehicle that's going to be hopefully providing us some views of. Uh, Orion as it splashes down under the its massive three main parachutes. As I said, it's uh, getting into place for that now, and uh, once it does pick up Orion, it'll be starting with an infrared view to capture its heat signature, and then changing to the color camera view that we saw earlier as the sun was rising over the Pacific Ocean. About uh, 45 minutes now until splashdown. The crew module separated from the rest of the vehicle making its way back through uh, back towards the Earth's atmosphere while the uh, service module and the Delta IV Heavy upper stage are left to make their own way home. Coming up in about four minutes, uh, the Delta will be doing a, an engine firing that will set it on its way back through Earth's atmosphere as well for a controlled deorbit north of Hawaii.
We're less than 30 minutes away now from uh, the entry interface that Orion will be experiencing once it comes to the Earth's atmosphere. This, of course, is uh, simulating what we would see on a return from deep space. Orion is uh, the vehicle that we'll be sending to deep space. Uh, we, of course, uh, retired the space shuttles just a few years ago in order to be able to spend our focus and energy on deep space and sending humans farther than we've ever gone before. Uh, but, uh, of course, we weren't ready to give up uh, all the research that we're getting done on the International Space Station. So to be able to do both at once, we uh, made some new partnerships with the commercial sector. We're going to hear more about that now. NASA's Orion spacecraft is designed to send astronauts on exploration missions into deep space. Closer to Earth, orbiting about 250 miles up, NASA is using the International Space Station to conduct cutting-edge research and technology development and to increase our knowledge about what it takes to live and work for long periods of time in space. Currently, the six crew members of the space station travel to and from the orbiting laboratory in Russian Soyuz spacecraft. NASA's commercial crew program is spearheading the development of a U.S. commercial crew space transportation capability that provides safe, reliable, and cost-effective access to and from the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. In September, NASA selected two commercial providers, Boeing and SpaceX, to develop the systems to transport astronauts from U.S. soil to and from the space station using the company's Boeing CST-100 and SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. These new American spacecraft will also allow us to add a seventh crew member to the space station and double the amount of time the crew has to conduct research aboard the unique microgravity laboratory. Certifying and using U.S. commercial company spacecraft to provide transportation services to low Earth orbit allows NASA to expand its focus to even more ambitious missions, sending astronauts to explore an asteroid learning in the proving ground of space around the moon. Ultimately, NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft and the skills and techniques learned in lunar orbit will enable humans to explore Mars. We are going to different exploration destinations, so we need different systems. NASA will own and operate its Orion spacecraft and space launch system for deep space missions, and will purchase services from Boeing and SpaceX to get astronauts to and from the station. That's what America's space program should look like in the 21st century. Obviously, lots going on to be excited about in space flight, uh, but the upcoming event, of course, is Orion Splashdown, which is now just 35 minutes away. Since it's getting close, we're going to turn everything over to Rob Davies at Mission Control Houston to get us down through Splashdown. Rob? And welcome back to the Orion Flight Control Room here at Mission Control in Houston, uh, where the uh, team of uh, flight controllers under the direction of Mike Serafin, the lead flight director, on console as they have been uh, since the wee hours this morning, and now are heading into the home stretch of this milestone mission for the United States. Uh, while uh, you were at uh, uh, Hangar AE with Brandy Dean, uh, Serafin uh, polled his team of flight controllers here for an extension of the power-up of Orion uh, once it is on the water in the Pacific Ocean. So that power-up uh, extension uh, to keep Orion powered up uh, from a nominal uh, time of 15 minutes after splashdown uh, has been approved. So Orion will stay powered up now for an hour after its uh, predicted splashdown just 33 and a half minutes from now. And that will enable Lockheed Martin to gain some valuable data on the thermal effects uh, after uh, Orion is back on Earth so that uh, it uh, will enhance uh, the post-flight analysis of all of Orion's systems and how they fared during its flight of four hours and 23 minutes. Uh, just a, a few moments ago, uh, the upper stage of the Delta IV rocket and its attached service module uh, that uh, Orion had been attached to, uh, it uh, performed a final uh, burn of uh, that upper stage engine, uh, a disposal burn, if you will, uh, to place at a safe distance away from Orion, and uh, it will uh, plummet into the ocean uh, to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, its job having been uh, well completed uh, throughout the day 
today. So the next mi major milestone we're looking at is just seven minutes from now. That will be about a 10 second firing of the thrusters on Orion in what is called the crew module raise burn. It's essentially a burn uh, to test the thrusters and to slightly orient the spacecraft into the proper uh, attitude or orientation for its uh, entry into the Earth's atmosphere, which is scheduled just 22 minutes from now. Orion uh, flying free uh, is uh, over the Pacific Ocean, currently at an altitude of uh, 1,643 statute miles, having reached its peak altitude at 9.11 a.m. Central Time this morning. Uh, its peak altitude reached at 3,604 miles, uh, the statute miles uh, above the Earth, the farthest uh, any uh, human-rated or human-occupied spacecraft has uh, flown away from Earth since Apollo 17 uh, 42 years ago in December of 1972. About uh, 17 minutes after reaching peak altitude, uh, the uh, crew module separated uh, from uh, the uh, upper stage of the Delta IV rocket and its uh, accompanying service module. Uh, the guidance officer here in Mission Control reported uh, that all of Orion's guidance systems were in excellent shape and that its thrusters were providing excellent control. Earlier, uh, Flight Dynamics Officer Mark McDonald here in Mission Control uh, took a look at uh, the guidance uh, data being received uh, from onboard computers on Orion along with its GPS system and calculated a uh, splashdown target point of 23.61 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude out in the Pacific Ocean. That's just 1.3 nautical miles or 1.5 statute miles east of the pre-flight target that had been calculated for Orion's return to Earth. That's almost a dead-on bullseye splashdown that is predicted for Orion. It uh, will be pulling about 8.2 Gs uh, at the peak uh, of its its velocity back to Earth, which will reach about 20,000 miles an hour at the time of entry interface when it's about 400,000 miles above, uh, 400,000 feet above the Earth's uh, atmosphere, uh, heading uh, for its high speed re entry back uh, towards Earth and a splashdown just 30 minutes from now at uh, 1028 a.m. Central Time, 828 uh, a.m. Pacific Time. The splashdown target is uh, 275 miles west of Baja, California, 630 miles southwest of San Diego. The port of San Diego, where the naval base in San Diego is located, is uh, the port of call for Orion once it is towed back uh, uh, under uh, the auspices of the USS Anchorage, uh, which is uh, in the splashdown zone. Uh, the USS Anchorage, a San Antonio class amphibious transport dock, is the second ship of the US Navy ever to be named after Anchorage, Alaska. Its keel was laid down on September 24, 2007 at the Avondale Shipyard in New Orleans, and then owned by Northrop Grumman Ship Systems. Uh, that ship was launched back on February 12, 2011. It is also being assisted in the recovery operations today by the U.S. Naval Ship Salvor, a Safeguard class rescue and salvage ship, the second U.S. Navy ship of that name. Uh, it launched on uh, July 28, 1984, and was commissioned on June 14, 1986. Airborne in the uh, splashdown zone is also the Ikana unpiloted uh, airborne vehicle uh, that uh, we are hoping will provide uh, views of Orion under its three main parachutes as it descends uh, uh, towards its splashdown target. And there is a live view from the Ikana right now as uh, it is just uh, awaiting uh, the arrival of Orion, uh, flying at an altitude of some uh, 20,000 uh, feet above the Earth uh, over the Pacific Ocean. We're about two, two minutes away from uh, the uh, raise burn, as it is called, this brief firing of Orion's thrusters uh, to fine-tune its orientation uh, relative uh, to the angle uh, of attack that it will be arriving at uh, when, once it enters the Earth's atmosphere just 18 and a half minutes from now.
Orion uh, using uh, its uh, strings of thrusters, uh, two redundant strings of uh, thrusters, six thrusters to each string uh, to uh, provide uh, the proper orientation for this so-called raise burn. Again, uh, this raise burn is uh, simply a test of the thruster system uh, before Orion begins to plummet back into the Earth's atmosphere. A series of critical activities will be happening in rapid-fire succession once Orion reaches uh, the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the uh, jettisoning of the forward bay cover that is uh, basically at the very top of the spacecraft that will expose uh, the variety of uh, parachutes that we'll talk about once again in just a moment. Orion now has maneuvered uh, into the correct orientation for its raise burn and for its ultimate angle of attack into the Earth's atmosphere. And the raised burn is in progress. Good control by the guidance navigation and control officer. And the raised burn is complete. We are now into the uh, coast to entry segment of this flight. Orion currently targeting a splashdown point with the coordinates uh, once again uh, from the flight dynamics officer of 23.61 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude. That uh, should put its splashdown just about a mile and a half, one and a half statute miles east of the intended uh, splashdown target that had been predicted and modeled uh, for this uh, brand new spacecraft pre-flight. The uh, parachute system that will enable Orion uh, to descend from a blistering speed of 20,000 miles an hour at entry interface to a gentle 20 miles an hour at splashdown just about 11 minutes later. Uh, the Orion again will be entering the atmosphere uh, and will start heating up and slowing down due to the drag of the atmosphere. At about 24,000 feet, uh, the forward bay cover parachute mortars will fire to pull the three chutes above the vehicle. About one and a half seconds later at 23 3,400 feet. That forward bay cover is jettisoning. It will be jettisoned, exposing the drogue, pilot, and main parachutes. Two drogue mortars will fire about two seconds after the forward bay cover is jettisoned, and the drogue parachutes will unfurl, stabilizing the crew module. Some 56 seconds later, the drogue parachutes are released. Three pilot mortars will fire at approximately 7,980 feet, releasing the three pilot parachutes, which in turn pull the main parachutes out. The pilot parachutes release from the main chutes, allowing the mains to unfurl. Both the drogue and the main chutes will reef at deployment, which uh, is a gradual uh, unfurling of those chutes, uh, preventing a rapid deceleration and reducing the possibility of damaging the parachutes themselves. These main parachutes will reef uh, by uh, opening to about 3% of their full size for 8 seconds, then about 10% of their full size for another 8 seconds, then they'll be fully opened until splashdown, at which time they'll be released from the crew module. The uh, three main parachutes, as you've heard uh, described in other uh, discussions uh, throughout the course of our broadcast today, are uh, quite impressive. Uh, these three uh, chutes when uh, fully deployed, uh, stretch uh, the length of a football field. Uh, they're each uh, 116 feet in diameter, 220 feet in total length once deployed. We are 13 uh, minutes away from entry interface. 
Orion uh, transiting uh, the Pacific Ocean currently at an altitude of 887 miles, having reached its peak altitude uh, not quite an hour ago of 3,604 statute miles above the Earth, having uh, performed uh, flawlessly uh, in its uh, first flight, uh, exceeding expectations to this point, but now the uh, critical milestones of entry must be met and will be met uh, in rapid fire succession, as we said, with 22 minutes until splashdown. The uh, guidance officer reports that we are tracking straight down the corridor for an on target splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Inside 12 minutes now until entry interface, inside 18 minutes until forward bay covered jettisoning, and just 19 minutes away from the deployment of the main chutes that will enable Orion to gently splash down in the Pacific Ocean. You can see uh, here on the uh, forward screen here in Mission Control uh, the uh, flight dynamics uh, tracking and the guidance tracking of Orion uh, right down the pike for its intended splashdown point, uh, just uh, 275 miles west of Baja, California, some 630 miles southwest of San Diego, to which Orion will be towed to, to the naval base in San Diego by the USS Anchorage once it is safely inside the well deck of that uh, vessel. Nine and a half minutes until entry interface. Once again, uh, with all of Orion's systems functioning uh, to perfection during this uh, first test flight for the vehicle, Flight Director Mike Serafin has extended uh, the power-up phase of the post-splashdown time frame for Orion uh, from 15 minutes to a full hour uh, to enable Lockheed Martin to acquire uh, invaluable data on the uh, thermal effects that Orion uh, will be experiencing shortly once it reaches the Earth's atmosphere Entry interface, uh, the first traces of the Earth's atmosphere coming up in just eight minutes. Orion uh, 
which a short time ago, about an hour ago, was at a peak altitude of 3,604 statute miles above the Earth, now just 500 miles above the Earth, range to splash down 3,036 miles. This uh, view uh, from the Ikana unpiloted airborne vehicle that's in uh, the splashdown zone is showing uh, one of the P-3 aircraft, part of the uh, recovery uh, force uh, of uh, boats, vessels, the USS Anchorage, the U.S. naval ship Salvor, uh, and other airborne assets that are uh, tracking uh, the arrival of Orion uh, for its splashdown of the Pacific Ocean just 16 and a half minutes from now. Uh, again, this uh, P-3 aircraft will be tracking uh, some of the peak heating data, recording peak heating data on Orion uh, that will be uh, analyzed uh, post-flight by Lockheed Martin uh, on behalf of the Orion program. Orion now 400 miles above the Earth, range to splash down 2,600 miles. The uh, recovery team uh, in the Pacific uh, reporting good navigational data from Orion as it uh, goes right down the pike heading for its splashdown target one and a half uh, statute miles east of its pre-flight predicted target point in the Pacific Ocean. Now just five minutes until entry interface. At that point, uh, Orion will be 400,000 feet above the Earth, traveling at uh, almost 20,000 miles an hour. Launched from Complex 37 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station four hours, ten minutes ago. Orion is now less than 14 minutes from its return to Earth, anticipating uh, the succession of events that will begin uh, three and a half minutes from now at the point of entry interface, where Orion uh, will reach a velocity of some 20,000 miles an hour, some 84% of uh, the velocity that a spacecraft uh, would encounter uh, on a trip back from the moon. And now we're receiving a live video from Orion from inside the crew module and one of the flight test cameras 
three minutes away from entry interface. Orion uh, right on track. It's guidance perfect. We may be uh, experiencing a uh, telemetry uh, loss of signal uh, during a, a brief blackout period after entry interface when uh, the plasma effects uh, begin to build around the spacecraft. That uh, may uh, begin at an altitude of about 374,000 feet, may continue up until about 151,000 feet, but this is a variable, and uh, we'll stand by to see if, in fact, we do lose any data during this brief blackout period, and if so, for how long. Everything quiet here in the uh, flight control room. Flight controllers uh, under the direction of Mike Serafin, uh, the lead flight director, uh, watching their data inside two minutes until entry interface. Orion now 132 miles above the Earth, range to splashdown 1,200 miles, 11 minutes until splashdown. Coming up on one minute until entry interface. Standing by for entry interface. Orion now at an altitude of 470,000 feet, 900 miles from its splashdown target. Guidance officer confirms that Orion has reached entry interface. The moment of truth for Orion for the next 9 minutes 45 seconds. And as expected, uh, we have uh, reached a uh, loss of uh, telemetry as we enter this uh, brief blackout period. Uh, at the time of the blackout, uh, the flight dynamics officer reported uh, that all of Orion's systems uh, looked perfect. This is uh, the point in time uh, where Orion uh, would be uh, experiencing its peak heating of some uh, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it barrels uh, through the Earth's atmosphere, traveling uh, about 20,000 miles an hour, some 84% of the velocity of a spacecraft returning from the moon. We're four minutes away from the uh, jettison 
of the forward bay cover at the very top of the spacecraft that will begin uh, the shoot deployment sequence. And we've uh, reacquired uh, signal from Orion, good data being processed. This view from the Ikana uh, unpiloted airborne uh, vehicle over the Pacific Ocean, over the splashdown zone. Time to splashdown, seven minutes. Range to splashdown, 127 miles. And now this view from Orion, its thrusters uh, maintaining control. Flight Dynamics Officer reports that we're tracking right down the middle. G-Force is building up on Orion, now almost to 3 Gs. A predicted G-Force load of some 8 to 8.3 Gs expected. And uh, the uh, Global Positioning System satellites have a good lock on Orion as it uh, heads toward its splashdown target. We're two and a half minutes away from forward bay cover jettison, and this view again from the Ikana aircraft over the splashdown zone. Orion at 125,000 feet. Healthy thruster system reported by the propulsion officer here in Mission Control. Passing through 80,000 feet. Range to splash down about five miles. passing through 60,000 feet. Orion has gone subsonic. Standing by for forward bay cover jettison. Thirty five thousand feet. That view of Orion from the Akana. Twenty five thousand feet. Time to splash down less than four minutes. Forward bay cover has been deployed. Drogues have been deployed. Great video from the Akana. Fifteen thousand feet until splashdown. Coming up on main chute deploy.
From a waypoint over the Pacific Ocean, there is your new spacecraft, America. Drogues away. Main chute deploy. On mains, everything looking good. Good reefing reported. Four thousand feet. Three good main shoots reported uh, from the USS Anchorage. That's confirmed here in Mission Control. From a high speed rate of uh, twenty thousand miles an hour to a gentle return back to Earth, more than four hours and 20 minutes after it took off on a Delta IV heavy rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Thirty-two hundred feet now until splashdown. Twenty two hundred feet now. Winds uh, at the surface uh, just about twelve knots. Wave heights uh, no more than about four and a half feet or so. Perfect conditions for Orion's homecoming. This view uh, from Orion itself uh, of the chutes, helping it uh, to descend gently towards uh, its splashdown in the Pacific. 1,000 feet. Just a few hundred feet until splashdown. One hundred feet. We have splashdown. Splashdown confirmed at 10.29 a.m. Central Time. Orion is back on Earth. America has driven a golden spike as it crosses a bridge into the future. And we now have confirmation that Orion is stable one, upright. Orion splashed down at a mission elapse time of four hours and 24 minutes. And the uh, crew module uprighting system uh, is now being activated. These are the five inflatable airbags at the, uh, at the top of the spacecraft to ensure that Orion remains in an upright position. And you can see it uh, on the water.
The Flight Dynamics Officer now has uh, provided a final splashdown uh, target in the Pacific with a latitude of 23.6 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude, a bullseye splashdown for America's newest spacecraft. Splashdown occurring once again at 10.29 a.m. Central Time, 8.29 a.m. Pacific Time, at a point uh, some 270 miles or so west of Baja, California, about 630 statute miles southwest of San Diego. This is Mission Control Houston. Here in the uh, flight control room, uh, procedures uh, for post-splashdown uh, activities and the monitoring of data. And there you can see in the, uh, in the mission director's uh, room at Hangar AE at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, smiles, exuberance, celebration. Uh, Orion's maiden flight from start to finish was picture perfect. Significant milestones achieved for the Orion program as we move forward uh, towards uh, future steps that will ultimately take us to Mars. But this day belonged uh, to the team uh, all the way around Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance, NASA, all of the contractors involved in the development and testing of Orion for what uh, turned out to be the most perfect flight you could ever imagine and a first flight of a vehicle that was being tested, a brand new vehicle launched on a Delta IV rocket, a splashdown right on target in the Pacific Ocean, a significant milestone for America's space program. That uh, view from uh, the Akana is one of the Zodiac craft uh, moving uh, toward the uh, location where Orion uh, is uh, gently uh, bobbing in the Pacific Ocean upright in Stable 1 with all five of its uh, inflatable airbags uh, having inflated properly to maintain it at a 180 degree orientation upright. It splashed down Stable 1 and stayed in that uh, configuration through the time that uh, its airbag system was deployed. Uh, every single system on this spacecraft functioned by the book from start to finish. Thank you. 
to uh, recap, uh, Orion, uh, following its launch, uh, made two orbits of the Earth, the first elliptical, the second highly elliptical, uh, boosted uh, towards its uh, its point in the sky and in, into deep space by the upper stage of a Delta IV rocket that uh, launched the vehicle from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Launch Complex uh, 37 at 6.05 a.m. Central Time, 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time. Orion uh, passed through the Van Allen radiation belt twice, all of its systems functioning perfectly, no effects whatsoever on the shielding or the computers or the avionics of the uh, craft. Reaching a peak altitude at 9.11 a.m. Central of 3,604.2 statute miles. The uh, crew module separated uh, from the uh, service module right on time at uh, 9.28 a.m. Central Time. And then we moved uh, towards uh, the critical entry phase. Uh, once again, uh, this view uh, we're looking uh, from one of the helicopters providing a sequential still video uh, of Orion in the water, uh, perfectly upright, uh, having splashed down upright, they're releasing its parachutes. The waves uh, cooperating, the weather cooperating uh, at the splashdown zone. Orion uh, entered uh, the high speed uh, part of its uh, journey back to Earth uh, with entry interface uh, reaching uh, the first traces of Earth's atmosphere at 10.19 a.m. Central Time, uh, moving at a speed of about 20,000 miles an hour. Uh, moments later entered a very brief blackout period while uh, the plasma effects of its uh, descent uh, into the Earth's atmosphere uh, blocked uh, telemetry from being received here in Mission Control. Once again, uh, you're looking at uh, a variety of vessels and uh, aircraft uh, moving uh, towards Orion in the, the initial phase of the recovery process that will, that will result in uh, Orion uh, being uh, winched and uh, pulled into the uh, flooded well deck of the USS Anchorage uh, for its uh, trip back to the port of San Diego, Naval Base San Diego. We, uh, we now uh, received... Uh, a, uh, a report that uh, three of the five uh, crew module uprighting system airbags at the top of the uh, spacecraft did inflate fully. One uh, was partially inflated. A uh, fifth bag uh, was not uh, clearly visible uh, to the uh, initial recovery team members, uh, but uh, irrespectful of that, Orion landed in an upright position under its three main parachutes in Stable 1, as it is called. If you recall from the old Apollo days, uh, Stable 2 would have meant upside down. It landed Stable 1, it splashed down in Stable 1, and maintained uh, its upright position through the use of its uh, airbag system at the very top of the spacecraft.
here in Mission Control in Houston, uh, the work is not done. As uh, Flight Director Mike Serafin and his team of flight controllers uh, continue to watch over uh, the initial uh, recovery uh, procedures uh, being executed out in the Pacific Ocean, some 275 miles west of Baja and some 630 miles southwest of San Diego. Serafin, uh, about an hour or so ago, gave a uh, green light uh, after polling his team of flight controllers uh, for the extended power-up of Orion in the water uh, to provide uh, Lockheed Martin a uh, bonus opportunity uh, to retrieve thermal data uh, from the spacecraft uh, from its high-speed reentry back to Earth where temperatures around the vehicle rose to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So far, uh, the report uh, is that uh, there are no hazardous conditions around the spacecraft, no leaks being uh, detected. Small boats are uh, making their way towards Orion for the initial phase of the recovery. The uh, landing and uh, recovery uh, operations folks uh, on the scene uh, in the Pacific Ocean uh, verifying with Flight Director Mike Serafin here in Houston at Mission Control that there are no liens against approaching Orion for the initial phase of uh, its recovery. And uh, the view uh, of Orion. Again, uh, multiple views uh, from uh, both uh, airborne craft and uh, vessels on the water of uh, the Orion spacecraft as uh, it awaits uh, the arrival of uh, the recovery teams. Uh, that are uh, making their way. The uh, preliminary word uh, from the uh, Pacific is that uh, the pilot chutes and the drogue chutes uh, were not uh, recovered. 
Uh, that was not unexpected. The main chutes are uh, nearby. Those are expected to be recovered. Uh, this uh, smoke flare and uh, the green dye in the ocean uh, indicating uh, to uh, the airborne uh, recovery team uh, exactly where the Orion is located so that they can uh, make their way in a more efficient fashion uh, towards the spacecraft. Also uh, receiving reports now that the forward bay cover was not uh, recoverable either in the Pacific Ocean. But again, uh, all the data of all of the functionality of Orion during its high-speed return back to Earth uh, has been logged and will be analyzed by Lockheed Martin and the Orion program in the days and weeks ahead. Again, a good view of Orion uh, as it awaits uh, the arrival of uh, the recovery a splashdown occurring 18 minutes ago at 10:29 uh, a.m. Central Time, 8:29 a.m. Pacific Time. The coordinates for splashdown, the final coordinates of splashdown, 23.6 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude. Orion splashing down just about uh, one and a half statute miles east of its pre-flight predicted target. The uh, Orion is in the, is at uh, its station in the Pacific awaiting uh, recovery operations. This is a point about 275 statute miles uh, west of Baja and some 630 statute miles southwest of San Diego to where Orion will be uh, transported in the well deck of the USS Anchorage over the next several days. Recovery operations uh, in the Pacific for Orion well underway. Uh, just to recap, a splashdown occurring at uh, 10.29 a.m. Central Time. There's a good view of Orion. Uh, we uh, wound up uh, with three and a half of the five uh, crew module uprighting system airbags uh, fully uh, inflated. But nonetheless, Orion... Uh, under its uh, main parachutes, which are being recovered uh, by naval uh, boats in the area. Uh, those uh, three uh, main chutes are being recovered. The forward bay cover itself, the drogue chutes, and the pilot chutes uh, were not uh, able to be recovered according uh, to the recovery teams.
Well, we uh, continue to watch uh, some of the video being provided uh, from recovery assets out in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the uh, Lockheed Martin mission manager, Brian Austin, at Hangar AE at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, where this uh, milestone journey began uh, almost five hours ago, uh, offering congratulations uh, to Shane Roski, the uh, Orion launch conductor, who uh, oversaw the uh, countdown and liftoff of the vehicle, as well as uh, Mike Serafin, uh, the lead flight director here in Mission Control. The uh, recovery teams in the Pacific now uh, indicating uh, that uh, two of the three main parachutes uh, were recovered, not the third. So um, the fact that uh, at least uh, two of the chutes uh, were recovered by the uh, teams out in the Pacific is good news. Uh, they also will be analyzed uh, post-mission for their uh, performance. But as you saw uh, from the uh, video from the Akana unpiloted uh, airborne vehicle uh, during the final moments of Orion's descent uh, for its splashdown in the Pacific. Uh, they functioned perfectly, enabling Orion to touch down at a velocity of about 20 miles an hour or so for a very gentle splashdown in the Pacific. The coordinates once again uh, where Orion is, you can see Orion right there. 23.6 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude. This video uh, of uh, Orion in the Pacific Ocean uh, with the uh, recovery teams again making their way uh, towards the spacecraft, uh, which is in excellent shape. Orion uh, reaching uh, the critical milestone of entry interface, uh, plummeting through the Earth's atmosphere at 10.19 a.m. Central Time. From that point until splashdown, it was a 10-minute uh, ride uh, down to Earth first uh, at a speed of about 20,000 miles an hour. It's uh, heat shield uh, performing uh, as advertised, repelling temperatures uh, that uh, rose to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit around the spacecraft. And then uh, it's uh, shoots uh, deploying in sequential fashion to uh, slow Orion down uh, to a speed of just 20 miles an hour at the point uh, at which it uh, hit the water remaining in an upright uh, position. 
Stable One, as it is called, uh, assisted uh, by at least three and a half uh, to four of the uh, crew module uprighting system airbags at the top of the spacecraft. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, once again, Orion uh, bobbing passively in the Pacific Ocean as uh, some of the uh, recovery vessels are now approaching uh, the vehicle uh, to begin uh, several hours of uh, making sure that Orion is uh, cinched in place and uh, brought uh, into a flooded well deck in the USS Anchorage, uh, the prime uh, recovery vessel uh, for this maiden flight of America's newest vehicle. Splashdown uh, occurring at 10.29 a.m. Central Time, 8.29 a.m. Pacific Time, at a point uh, some 275 miles west of Baja, California, 630 miles southwest of San Diego. The coordinates, once again, 23.6 degrees north latitude, 116.46 uh, degrees west longitude.
This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, it's been about 34 minutes since Orion splashed down in the Pacific Ocean in excellent shape. Uh, Flight Director Mike Serafin getting a brief report indicating that uh, Orion's cooling systems are operating uh, just superbly and uh, that the vehicle is airtight. Uh, out in the Pacific Ocean aboard the USS Anchorage, which is uh, the uh, vanguard uh, ship for this recovery operation, is Public Affairs Officer Amber Philman. Amber, uh, give us an update on how the recovery is proceeding. Thanks, Rob. Here on the USS Anchorage, we saw a picture-perfect splashdown of Orion, approximately 600 miles southwest of San Diego. For the team tasked with recovery, this is where their work really begins. NASA, the U.S. Navy, and Lockheed Martin are working together to recover the Orion crew module. Two of the main chutes have already been recovered, and our small boats are about 120 yards away from the crew module. Over the next few hours, the Navy divers and Zodiac boats will check for any hazards around Orion. They'll attach the sea anchor, load distributing horse collar, and tether lines, and work to get into the ship's well deck. The spacecraft will be set down in the well deck, secured, and then the ship will begin the journey back to Naval Base San Diego. Orion will be returned to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for deservicing and to gather more information on how it performed in space. The team here is in position and ready to go ahead and recover the vehicle once it's powered down. I'll send you back to Rob and the Mission Control in Houston. Thanks, Amber. Uh, a lot of work ahead uh, for uh, the folks that uh, you are with out on uh, the USS Anchorage and all of the other uh, components of this uh, recovery uh, team uh, that will bring Orion into the well deck of the Anchorage uh, a few hours from now. As you can see, uh, it is uh, currently 9.05 a.m. Uh, out in the Pacific Ocean, some 36 minutes after Orion's splashdown. Uh, which was uh, on target uh, just about right at the exact spot that was predicted and modeled pre-flight uh, under the uh, three main parachutes uh, Orion gently splashed down at uh, 10.29 a.m. Central Time, 8.29 a.m. Pacific Time to wrap up a mission of four hours and 24 minutes in duration following its launch from the uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station earlier today. The uh, report uh, from the recovery uh, team out in the Pacific is that uh, all of uh, the various uh, vessels are uh, just 120 yards away from the spacecraft, and they are upwind uh, from Orion. Everything is in great shape, uh, no, uh, no leaks. The vehicle is airtight. It's in excellent uh, condition, and uh, they are just waiting uh, for the power down of Orion's systems. If you recall, uh, Flight Director Mike Serafin uh, took a poll uh, about an hour or so ago of Orion Systems. Everything was just uh, magnificent. And uh, he uh, gave approval for an extended power up of the spacecraft uh, so that uh, additional data on uh, the thermal conditioning of the vehicle could be provided to Lockheed Martin engineers. So uh, with the uh, splashdown occurring uh, some 38 minutes or so ago, we are expecting the power down uh, about 22 minutes from now, and that uh, will enable the recovery uh, teams uh, to move closer to the vehicle to begin uh, to uh, secure it uh, for, uh, for its uh, ability to get back into that flooded well deck of the anchorage just a few hours from now. The uh, director of the uh, recovery and landing operations, Jeremy Graber, uh, 
is uh, currently uh, complimenting uh, all of the other teams, including uh, the flight control team here in Houston, led by Mike Serafin, uh, who has worked uh, tirelessly on uh, the coordination and preparation for this mission, along with his team of legacy uh, space shuttle and space station flight controllers uh, for quite a long time uh, to realize uh, this dream uh, to launch Orion, test its systems, and bring it back safely to Earth. And that was done in spades today as Orion uh, proved itself uh, not only a capable vehicle, but a vehicle uh, built uh, to perfection for this first flight test.
This is Mission Control Houston, some 45 minutes now uh, following the splashdown of Orion in the Pacific. Uh, you're watching uh, what amounts to a sequential still video from uh, some of the recovery vessels in the area, about 120 yards away from the spacecraft. About another 15 minutes uh, left uh, before uh, Flight Director Mike Serafin here in Mission Control uh, sends uh, the commanding uh, through his flight controllers uh, to power down Orion. And uh, at that point, he will hand over uh, the uh, mission, if you will, uh, to the uh, recovery teams out of the Pacific who will move closer to Orion and begin to secure it uh, to bring it into the flooded well deck of the USS Anchorage. This flight uh, has been uh, beyond uh, the wildest imagination of the Orion program. Uh, clearly, there were issues with the vehicle, a brand new vehicle that had been expected uh, throughout the course of this flight test. However, uh, every minute of the four hours and 24 minutes of Orion's flight from launch to splashdown ticked off in uh, perfect fashion with no issues of any significance uh, reported on any of the Orion program milestones that uh, had been uh, laid down by the program itself uh, in this first flight test. Uh, Lockheed Martin and United Launch Alliance working in concert uh, under uh, the contract uh, that was uh, to the Orion program to ensure that uh, this flight would go off without a hitch, and indeed it did.
This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, again, uh, you're watching uh, video from uh, the Akana unpiloted uh, airborne uh, vehicle that's out in the Pacific Ocean uh, where Orion splashed down just about 51 minutes ago following a textbook uh, maiden flight, uh, a test flight uh, to uh, ring out uh, all of its systems, a shakedown mission uh, to uh, achieve uh, critical program milestones for the Orion program that will lead uh, to uh, more ambitious flights that are coming up in the years ahead uh, on the road to Mars. Splashdown occurring uh, at 10.29 a.m. Central Time, 8.29 a.m. Pacific Time at the point, uh, and once again, we'll give you those coordinates once again, at 23.6 degrees north latitude, 116.46 degrees west longitude, some 275 miles west of Baja, California, and some 600 miles or so uh, southwest of San Diego, where the Orion will be uh, uh, transported in the uh, well deck of the USS Anchorage in the next few days. We are expecting uh, the uh, lead flight director here in Mission Control, Mike Serafin, uh, to uh, direct his uh, flight controllers uh, to begin uh, the power down of Orion Systems about eight minutes from now. This extended power up since splashdown, uh, courtesy of the uh, perfect vehicle uh, that Orion was uh, throughout the course of uh, this day, a four hour and 24 minute mission since its liftoff uh, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station at uh, 6.05 a.m. Central Time, 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time.
This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, just shy of an hour following Orion's return to Earth and a textbook splashdown of the Pacific Ocean, uh, the uh, procedures are underway to begin the power down of the spacecraft that will enable uh, the recovery vessels uh, in the vicinity uh, to uh, move closer to uh, Orion to begin securing it. It uh, splashed down in an upright uh, so-called stable one position and remain that way through the use of its uh, inflatable airbags, the operating system at the top of the vehicle. Uh, Orion has been uh, sitting passively uh, to allow uh, additional thermal data from its high-speed reentry back to Earth to be uh, acquired and uh, for post-flight analysis by Lockheed Martin. And again, uh, the post-splashdown power down of the spacecraft is underway. Orion has now been powered down in the Pacific Ocean, uh, setting the stage uh, for the uh, rest of the recovery work to begin by the uh, NASA U.S. Navy team uh, out in the Pacific Ocean. It's been one hour since Orion returned to Earth following a picture-perfect four-hour, 24-minute shakedown mission. NRD flight on recovery loop. And Houston flight, this is NRD, go ahead. NRD, I am happy to report that Orion is powered down and uh, we are not carrying any hazards associated with recovery. Uh, while we're not quite sure what happened with the uh, fifth CMIS bag, uh, right now we do not uh, have any liens against uh, recovery per the hazard checklist. How do you copy? And Houston flight, I copy loud and clear. That's uh, great news, Mike. Uh, our team is uh, anxious and ready to uh, to approach uh, the CM and get into our uh, nominal recovery into the well deck of the Anchorage. And uh, knowing there's no hazards uh, makes it a whole lot easier for us uh, moving forward uh, through the rest of the recovery. Okay, you understand. Uh, pass on our thanks to the uh, captain and uh, crew of the USS Anchorage and the USNS Salvor. Um, 
Today was, was a great day for America. We challenged our best and brightest to uh, continue to lead in space. The, the men and women of America poured their hearts and souls into this mission, and along the way they inspired others. We became part of something greater than ourselves, and uh, while this was an unmanned mission, we were all on board Orion. NRD, um, we're going to sign off from Houston. And Houston flight, great words. Uh, congratulations to you and your team for an outstanding mission. Uh, it's uh, pretty amazing to put Orion exactly in the spot that uh, you had predicted. Uh, put it in a great place for us to uh, recover it, and uh, we'll be spending the next couple hours uh, getting Orion squared away and into the Anchorage's well deck. Uh, from our side here, all the recovery forces are very excited and we appreciate the great work you guys did today, and uh, we'll continue working. We copy NRD, and we look forward to uh, to, re to the return of Orion. Copy that. Thank you, sir. Houston signing off. Words from uh, Lead Flight Director Mike Serafin as uh, he congratulated the recovery team out in the Pacific, whose job uh, now lies ahead uh, to uh, bring Orion into the well deck of the USS Anchorage and to ultimately bring it back to the uh, port of San Diego, the naval base in San Diego, uh, where it ultimately will be uh, transported uh, back uh, to uh, Cape Canaveral for post-flight analysis. There are uh, days and then there are days, and this was one of those days uh, where everything went uh, by the book. A memorable day in America's space program. And with that, uh, we'll be signing off here from Mission Control. Orion, back safely on Earth, its journey, its maiden journey, having been accomplished. This is Mission Control Houston, handing it back to Brandy Dean at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Welcome back to Cape Canaveral and the Mission Director Center. It's clearing out, but it was the scene of lots of applause, uh, handshakes, and even hugs from the steely-eyed rocket men and women who are working here today. A uh, really great day for Orion. Uh, let's just recap it one more time. Orion launched on its first flight test at 7.05 a.m. Eastern from uh, Space Launch Complex 37 here in Cape Canaveral on top of a Delta IV heavy rocket. It made two orbits of the Earth and reached a peak altitude of 3,600 miles on the second orbit traveling through the Van Allen belts of radiation and uh, getting a good test of its computers, navigation and control systems, and uh, the jettison and separation events that have to happen to for a successful mission. Um, then as it returned from that high altitude, it accelerated to 20,000 miles per hour, and its heat shield uh, saw temperatures up to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it went through the Earth's atmosphere. The temperatures roughly twice what uh, you would see with molten lava, and uh, it came safely through on the other side in time to test the 11 parachutes that are required to get Orion safely down to the Pacific Ocean, which it splashed down into at 11.29 a.m. Eastern Time. It's been an amazing day for Orion and a great leap forward for NASA on its journey to Mars. Uh, thanks for tuning in to be tuning in and being part of the journey, but remember that it doesn't end here. Uh, we've already begun work on the second Orion, and when it's ready, it'll be stacked on top of a new space launch system that's already being built as well. On that mission, we'll go uh, further, actually, than uh, Ryan even did today, and further, in fact, than any spacecraft built for humans has ever been before. So there's lots to look forward to. Uh, you can uh, stick with us for all of that, we hope, and uh, start with the post-splashdown news conference. It's coming up at 1.30 p.m. Central Time here on NASA Television. Now we're going to go to a quick uh, look at some highlights from the day, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks so much for st staying with us. 15. Rofi ignition. 10. The igniters have been lit. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
and liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. I'm Peter Cullen, and you're watching NASA TV. Preparing the Orion crew module for its first flight test in December actually began a few years ago. Crew module for Orion's flight test arrived at Kennedy Space Center in Florida in June 2012 and was transported to the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building High Bay for manufacturing, processing, and pre flight testing. During the next two years, Orion Prime Contractor Lockheed Martin and NASA engineers and technicians built up the crew module from a green shell to a fully functional spacecraft. Many tests were performed to prepare Orion for its flight test. Orion service module arrived at Kennedy Space Center and also was transported to the operations and checkout building for build-up and processing. The module was completed with the installation of the fairings that protected in the early stages of launch ascent. Orion's heat shield containing more than 200 instrumentation sensors when installed. Heat shield will protect Orion during its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere and splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Moving one step closer to flight test. The Orion crew module was stacked atop the service module in June. Tile panels were installed around the spacecraft and then both modules were put through their final system tests. On September 11, the Orion stack was transported from the operations and checkout building to the payload hazardous servicing facility. Inside this facility, the spacecraft was fueled with ammonia, hydrazine, and high pressure helium ahead of its December flight test. The four major components for Orion's launch abort system, including the launch abort motor and the attitude control motor, arrived at Kennedy last year and were transported to the launch abort system facility for processing, testing, and integration. In late September, Orion was moved from the payload hazardous servicing facility to the launch abort system facility. Inside the high bay, the launch abort system was lowered and attached to Orion system is designed to protect astronauts if a problem arises during launch by pulling the spacecraft away from the falling rocket. Orion waited inside the launch abort system facility until the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket was ready for integration with the spacecraft. Earlier this year, the Delta IV core and starboard boosters arrived by barge in March and were offloaded and transported to the horizontal integration facility near Space Launch Complex. 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. The port booster and second stage 
followed in early May. The Delta IV Central Core Booster was mated to the port and starboard boosters. Then the Delta IV Second Stage was mated to the rocket's Central Core Booster. The Delta IV rocket for Orion's flight test rolled out of the horizontal integration facility on September 30th and made the trek to the launch pad. In the early morning on October 1st, the nearly 180-foot tall launch vehicle was carefully lifted into the vertical position and then raised into the mobile service tower on the pad. In early November, the Orion stack was transported to the launch pad and integrated to the rocket. Tests were performed to verify readiness for launch. After more than two years of work, Orion is now ready to soar on its first flight test. NASA's Orion spacecraft is designed to send astronauts on exploration missions into deep space. Closer to Earth, orbiting about 250 miles up, NASA is using the International Space Station to conduct cutting-edge research and technology development and to increase our knowledge about what it takes to live and work for long periods of time in space. Currently, the six crew members of the space station travel to and from the orbiting laboratory in Russian Soyuz spacecraft. NASA's commercial crew program is spearheading the development of a U.S. commercial crew space transportation capability that provides safe, reliable, and cost-effective access to and from the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. In September, NASA selected two commercial providers, Boeing and SpaceX to develop the systems to transport astronauts from U.S. soil to and from the space station using the company's Boeing CST-100 and SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. These new American spacecraft will also allow us to add a seventh crew member to the space station and double the amount of time the crew has to conduct research aboard the unique microgravity laboratory. Certifying and using U.S. commercial company spacecraft to provide transportation services to low Earth orbit allows NASA to expand its focus to even more ambitious missions, sending astronauts to explore an asteroid learning in the proving ground of space around the moon. Ultimately, NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft and the skills and techniques learned in lunar orbit will enable humans to explore Mars. We are going to different exploration destinations, so we need different systems. NASA will own and operate its Orion spacecraft and space launch system for deep space missions, and will purchase services from Boeing and SpaceX to get astronauts to and from the station. That's what America's space program should look like in the 21st century.
Here's a look at some of the top NASA stories of 2014. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. With 2014 marking the 45th anniversary of Neil Armstrong's historic first step on the moon, NASA outlined plans for America's next giant leap in space exploration, to send astronauts to Mars. To prepare for that leap, NASA stepped up development in 2014 of many game-changing technologies and capabilities. The agency worked on solar electric propulsion technology, which could enable cost-effective trips to deep space destinations. Destinations that could include a human mission in the 2020s to an asteroid placed into orbit around the moon by a robotic spacecraft as part of NASA's asteroid redirect mission. NASA plans to announce more specific details in December about potential candidate asteroids and the design of the mission. The successful first flight test in June of the saucer-shaped low-density supersonic decelerator demonstrated an inflatable system that could be used to land heavier and larger payloads than ever before on planets with atmospheres. The International Space Station continued its role as a unique platform off the Earth where astronauts are working for the Earth with biomedical research and with payloads delivered by commercial partners SpaceX and Orbital Sciences Corporation, such as the first 3D printer in space, which could be used to manufacture parts in space. And the addition of an Earth science instrument to the space station's exterior to monitor ocean surface wind speed and direction for use in weather forecasting and for monitoring large-scale changes in Earth's climate. In September, NASA selected two U.S. commercial providers, Boeing and SpaceX, to develop the systems to transport astronauts from U.S. soil to and from the space station with a goal of ending the nation's sole reliance on Russia in 2017. Development of the rocket and spacecraft designed to carry astronauts on NASA's journey to Mars progressed in 2014. The green light was given in August to start building the Space Launch System heavy lift rocket following successful completion of a key review. New manufacturing facilities began testing operations and prototypes built with new more lightweight composite materials were evaluated. In November, the fully assembled Orion spacecraft was moved to its launch pad at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida for its maiden flight test in December. NASA's fleet of Mars robotic explorers continued its work in 2014. The Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft arrived at the Red Planet in September as the newest member of the fleet. MAVEN is on a mission to investigate how the past loss of atmospheric gases impacted the Martian climate through time. Samples from the first rock drilled at the base of Mount Sharp by the Curiosity rover provided the first confirmation of a mineral mapped from orbit by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And the science instruments were selected for the Mars 2020 rover, the next robotic explorer NASA will send to Mars in 2020. It will conduct unprecedented science and exploration technology investigations, including potential habitability of the current environment and directly searching for signs of past life. NASA's role in studying and protecting our home planet has never been stronger. NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden called 2014 the Year of Earth for NASA, with the agency planning to launch five Earth science missions within a year's time. The first images from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission launched in February of an extratropical cyclone illustrated the mission's ability to provide next-generation detailed observations of global precipitation. In April, NASA celebrated Earth Day with a hugely popular online global selfie postings from around the world to help promote environmental awareness. And the test data from the orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 mission following its launch in July confirmed the health of the spacecraft's instruments. OCO2 will help track our impact on the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the various human-made and natural sources of CO2. 2014 included new discoveries, new intriguing mysteries, and new reasons to explore our solar system and beyond. In November, the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft, which has three NASA instruments on board, successfully landed its Philae robotic probe on the surface of a speeding comet, the first ever soft landing of a spacecraft on a comet. And NASA's Kepler Space Telescope discovered a new Earth-sized planet in April, about 500 light-years from us, that also may have liquid water. 
The agency's premier aeronautics research centers continue to work on solutions to help improve the safety, efficiency, and comfort of air travel while reminding people NASA is with you when you fly. A demonstration in November featured a wing that can change shape in flight. This could lead to technology for quieter and more fuel-efficient airliners. In September, NASA co-hosted an event that showcased two new technologies being evaluated that could improve takeoff time predictability of flights and help flight dispatchers choose more efficient routes around bad weather. And in May, NASA celebrated the renaming of its Dryden Flight Research Center to the Neil A. Armstrong Flight Research Center and designated Hugh Dryden's name to the center's aeronautical test range. That's a look back at some of the top NASA stories of 2014. Keep up with us in 2015 on social media and at www.nasa.gov slash twan. During Orion's flight test, the spacecraft will travel 3,600 miles into space, return to Earth at speeds of up to 20,000 miles per hour, and endure temperatures near 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean. For the team tasked with recovering Orion after splashdown, this is when the work will begin. NASA's Ground Systems Development and Operations Program, Orion Prime Contractor Lockheed Martin, and the U.S. Navy have worked hard to prepare practicing recovery operations during the past year to establish techniques they will use to recover Orion, the parachutes, and the forward bay cover from the water. We're working with the Navy to figure out a way to use these well deck ships that they have to get the capsule back in the well deck and allow the crew to get out basically on dry land in a sense. And so all this testing is about how to make that work. Before Orion launches on its flight test from the East Coast, the recovery team on the West Coast will embark aboard the U.S. Navy's amphibious ship, the USS Anchorage, and head out to sea. All of the necessary hardware and equipment will be carried below in the ship's well deck. It also is where Orion will be secured after the team recovers it. While the team waits for Orion to take flight, they will launch weather balloons from the deck of the ship and monitor sea conditions. Meanwhile, about an hour before splash time, helicopters will take off from the ship's deck and fly out to help locate Orion as it makes its descent toward the ocean. The helicopters also will help the team track Orion's protective forward bay cover and parachutes for the recovery. Teams in rigid hull inflatable boats will find and secure the hardware with floats until they're able to safely recover it. Minutes after Orion splashes down, the crew module uprighting system will inflate to help stabilize the spacecraft in case it doesn't land heat shield first into the water. U.S. Navy divers in Zodiac boats will check for any hazards around Orion. Then they'll attach a sea anchor, load distributing horse collar, and tether lines to the crew module and work to guide it to the ship's well deck. So it's our way of recovering the Orion crew module and we do it in a way that we protect the heat shield so that we can get as much good information um, as we can so for the engineering analysis that we'll do moving forward. The spacecraft will be set down on rubber shock absorbers secured to the deck and the ship will head toward Colorado.